nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Okay. So, as you know, the next three days I'll be giving a series of lectures. There'll be about six of them and the outline you can see broadly. And we have a guest lecture by Professor Lundstrom, which will be the next one for the nanotransistor. And <clears throat> I'll be doing it the uh, more or less the old-fashioned way, which is like it will be a bla blackboard lecture. So hopefully the pace will be, you know, comfortable. And at the end of the day, all three days actually, we have a discussion session. It's not really not a lab session or anything because, as you know, so there are no codes as such that we are trying to distribute. There's many codes that are already available on the Nano Hub. Many of you are familiar with it anyway. So that's not the purpose. Those sessions are really meant more as discussion sessions. And uh, it would help, be helpful if you have some questions ahead of time that you either email or uh, to Mr. Ganguly, I guess, you just introduce him, or you can hand it over to him. Just, you know, if you want to handwrite it on a piece of paper and hand it over to him, that's fine too if you have your own piece of paper. Or, and that will help me. We'll look at the questions and try to structure the discussion a little bit. I mean, not that you cannot ask questions then itself. That's fine too. Right? It will just help structure the thing a little. Okay. So that's the general purpose. And uh, so, yeah, let me get started then. So, <clears throat> uh, as you know, at the heart of my, this field of nanoelectronics or microelectronics is this device called this field effect transistor, and which is basically a resistor. That is, you have this channel with two contacts you call the source and the drain. And if you apply a voltage, you get a current. And of course, what makes it a transistor is that you can actually control the resistance through this third terminal called the gate. So that VG, the gate voltage, there shouldn't be any, ideally, there shouldn't be any current flowing through that terminal, through the, insul the, through the insulator. Although, as it turns out, you know, as the insulators get thinner, there is some current, but ideally there shouldn't be any current. What that voltage should be doing is simply controlling the resistance. Now, by the way, in this set of lectures, I really will try not to assume any specific background, you know, other than differential equations and matrices. That's about it. So, if you have any questions, if you are not familiar with certain things, you know, please do feel to raise them as you go, you go along. I'm not really trying to. Not really assuming you know a lot about any of this necessarily. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this relatively simple device, and we'll talk about how it works. And of course, Professor Lundstrom's talk will essentially it will be about this nanotransistor and how it works in detail. But this uh, device is really at the heart of uh, you know, all the wonderful things that computers do. That every computer we have has about a billion of this in it. In fact, the other day I was discussing with my colleague. Professor Alam, who was telling me that, well, you know, actually in this world, there's more transistors than there are ants. Because if you just look up on Google, apparently they say there's about a million ants per human being. For every human being, there's about a million ants. Well, but then, if you look at the number of transistors per human being, that's probably pretty, you know, I, I have about a billion here. And that's the same with everyone else, too. So it's really a, one of the, I mean, it's very numerous. There's a, more of these than anything else you can think of, if you think about it. And now, how did people get to pack a billion of these transistors into something that small? And the reason, of course, is that over the years, every transistor has gotten smaller and smaller. And this picture then, I guess one of the things I wanted to get clear to everyone is the length scales. That in a millimeter is something we are all familiar with. And if you go down by a factor of 1,000, that's the micrometer. And another factor of 1,000, that's a nanometer. Right? And over the years, what has happened is this transistor has gotten smaller and smaller. And that is how people are able to fit so many of them into such a small space. And you can do a little simple math, actually, that let's take something that's let's say 3 centimeters by 3 centimeters. 
Now, if each transistor can be fitted within, say, one micron by one micron, then the number of transistors you could fit this way would be 3 times 10 to the fourth. And the number you'd go this way would be 3 times 10 to the fourth. And so if you multiply that, that comes out as 9 times 10 to the eighth which is about a billion. So that roughly gives you the scale of things. I mean, that's how each transistor is getting fitted within this one micron by one micron. And that includes not just the channel, which actually is a whole lot smaller, but the contacts too, and everything together. That's about what it takes, okay? And so today, the commercial transistors, if you look at the length of the channel, that's really down to, say, tens of nanometers, you know, 50 nanometers, which if you think about it, is again a few hundred atoms. That's the commercial transistors. And if you look at research, what people do in their research laboratories, that's actually, you know, of course, they've measured even a hydrogen molecule. They've measured the resistance of something as small as that, see? And this is all that has happened in the last 20 or 30 years. And so back when I was a graduate student, and that's like 20, 30 years ago, you know, one of the questions that we often used to talk about is, what's the resistance of something that's really small? Because, you know, the way you learn about resistance is this Ohm's law, right? You learn that R, write it here, R is equal to rho L over A. And, of course, the inverse of that, you write conductance, sigma A over L. And learn about this conductivity and resistivity. And <clears throat> based on that, you'd say as you keep making the length smaller and smaller, of course, the resistance should just get smaller. Now, the question is, does that really hold down to atomic dimensions? Well, no one really expects that because once you get smaller and smaller, you get into a whole different regime of transport because with big devices, you have what we call this div diffusive transport. That is, electrons come in here and then they move around in random directions like this and kind of on the whole drift towards the drain. That's what happens in big transistors. Whereas when you get down to small transistors, you have more like what you call ballistic transport. Ballistic meaning like a bullet, that it, that's it, like go straight. And in today's devices, it's somewhere in between, I guess. You know, but it's pretty close to ballistic these days. And so the whole nature of transport's changing. And one of the questions people used to ask is, well, what would the, happen to the resistance as you really cut down the length? And back in the 80s, of course, the answers were not at all clear. You know, this made a very nice topic of discussion. You know, it's almost like the weather. You don't really know the answers. Something like you can talk about it for endlessly. But what happened over the last 20 years is, over in the 80s and 90s, is people actually started making these measurements. By late 80s, people had actually measured the resistance of ballistic conductors, and the results now are actually pretty clear, you see? And although the results are clear, the point I wanted to make is, it hasn't yet broadly influenced the way we think about devices, conduction, and all that. That just for historical reasons, we still think the old way, which is, we first learn about big things, and then we try to project that understanding down to small things. That's just because of the his history of the subject, you see. But, and of course it made a lot of sense 30 years ago because it's only at that end anyone knew the answers. So you start where you know the answers. It, and this end no one was sure of anything, you see. But now that we understand it more or less all the way across, I'd say it makes more sense or at least it makes sense to complement that view with a different view the one that kind of starts from the bottom up. And that's what this electronics from the bottom up is about. It's the approach to this, that, uh, try to think of conduction from this other end. <clears throat> and as you know, that's how you usually, uh, if you had a choice, that's what you do normally, see? I mean, how do you learn quantum mechanics? You start from hydrogen atom, and then you work up to big things. You don't first learn about solids and then try to figure out the hydrogen atom. I mean, that would make the hydrogen atom very confusing, really. And one of the points I wanted to get across is that, of course, when it comes to small things, it's very confusing if you try to take your understanding from big things and try to project it down. 
And so it's better to start at this end. But actually, even about big conductors, you can get a lot of insight if you start from small things and see how it, uh, and, and try to go upwards. And that's kind of the flavor of what we want to talk about in the next few lectures. And as you, as I, as you saw from the outline, I want to cover a quite a wide variety of topics. See? Okay. <clears throat> now, one result that I'll try to get across in the next few minutes actually is that, you know, I said that you know about this Ohm's law and the question was what happens when the length gets really small? And the answer actually is what's now believed is that you could just do this. Essentially. In other words, it's as if when the length goes to zero, there is some constant there, so it, the resistance doesn't really go to zero, but goes to some value, which is kind of what you would expect if you think of that, well, you know, there is a resistor and then I've got some contact resistance, all this stuff that's connecting to it. And you might think that, well, that's kind of the contact resistance. What wasn't realized though before is that this contact resistance has a fundamental significance. It has a special meaning and all that. Uh, and is for small conductors, it happens to be quantized as well. So those are the issues that we'll be talking about. Anyway, so this is then what I'd like to get to. Okay. Now, the first step in understanding conduction, I always say, is to draw, as you know, you usually draw something they call a band diagram. Here, it's kind of like that, but I, what we have here is this axis is the energy axis, this is the density of states. So at different energies, you have states available for conduction. Now, if you have, learned, if you have taken any courses on devices, often you start with something called an EK relation, and later on I'll talk a little more about that. But this concept is actually much more general, in the sense that, as you know, EK relations only apply to periodic solids, which where you know, we have crystalline structure and all that. Whereas even, it doesn't matter even if you're talking about a hydrogen atom or you're talking about an amorphous conductor, anything. Anything there is a, you can define a density of states. That is at a given energy, what states are available. So uh, this axis is energy, this axis is the density of states. And usually in many of these con conductors, in semiconductors, there's a gap there's certain ranges where there are no states available and some ranges where the states are available. Okay. So this is one of the first things you need to draw. And you could treat that almost as an experimental input. That is, how do I know where these states are? Well, th this is what people, any with new material, that's the first thing they would try to measure. How do they measure these states? Well, one of the common experiments is photoemission. That is, you hit it with light and you see what energy it takes to knock an electron out of the solid. So usually you think of the vacuum level as being somewhere here. That's usually about seven to eight volts down. You hit it with photons with that energy and you can knock it out. And by looking at what energy it takes, you can actually map out this density of states. Okay. So there's all kinds of experiments people have done over the years to map out this picture of what the states available are. Okay. And then you have these contacts, which are big regions, and where we assume that, let's say for the starters at least, that the, the density of states is more or less uniform. Lots of states available. And the second concept that we need here is that of this Fermi function. That is, the question you ask is that these states, how are they occupied with electrons? And the idea is that if it were a low temperature, then what you'd expect is everything up to some energy would be occupied. And that's what's called the electrochemical potential or the Fermi energy. That's the mu one. Now, if you were to draw this Fermi function then, so this axis is energy, this is the Fermi function. Everything above this energy would be empty. So the Fermi function should be zero. Everything below this energy should be full. And so that's one. Now that's at zero temperature. When you raise the temperature, it's spread out somewhat, as you might expect. And the spreading is over an energy scale of kT. 
and KT at room temperature is about 25 millivolts. Okay? So that's this Fermi function that I've written down. That's the function that I've tried to draw here. If you plot that, this is energy, plot that, that's what you get. And when you apply a voltage across this structure, anytime there's a positive voltage, it lowers all the energy levels. Positive makes it easier for electrons to get in there. We are drawing electron energies, so everything is lowered, including the quasi, this Fermi energy or the electrochemical potential. So everything up to here is filled. So this mu1 is different from mu2. And that's what sort of makes it a non-equilibrium problem. That is, at in equilibrium, there is a common electrochemical potential, just like there's a common temperature, for example. Whereas if you have two different temperatures, then you can have heat flow. Similarly, when you have two different chemical potentials, you can have flow of electrons. Okay? And so this is a non-equilibrium problem, and that what makes it non-equilibrium, of course, is that voltage. And because of that voltage, you have these two different electrochemical potentials. And you can draw the Fermi function here. It would look something like this. Okay. So what we want to write down is an expression for the conductance of this structure, like, or the current through this structure. Okay. Now the first question you can ask is, well, why does current flow through this? And this is where, again, if you look at the standard description, people would say, well, current flows because there's an electric field. And that I've always found confusing because of the following. And that is that if it is an electric field, you know, you say that, well, you have applied a voltage, so there's an electric field here. And that's why electrons start flowing. Now, if it's the electric field that drives the current, then, of course, all these electrons should start moving, including these, which is not what happens at all. So at that point, then people tell you, well, you know, of course, a filled band cannot conduct, and so no, nothing, no current flows here. And that's re that kind of gives you the feeling that something very mysterious is happening, which you don't quite understand, and that is why current only flows up here and not down here. But the point I want to make is that when you think about a small device, it's actually pretty clear why the current flows only out here and not out here. And the argument is the same, is very simple. It's like this. We have these states. Here's the electrochemical potential. So what this contact would like to do is fill up all the states up to here. Because it likes to make bring this channel into equilibrium with itself. Equilibrium means you want to get the same electrochemical potential. So it's really trying to fill up all these states. Okay. On the other hand, this contact, of course, has an electrochemical potential down here, so it would really like to keep all these states empty. And so what happens is, this contact keeps filling them up, and this contact keeps pulling them out. And of course, once it's out there, then it flows out of this contact and goes back to the battery. And the one that was left behind, a new one comes in. And that's why, of course, current keeps flowing forever. That's basically it, you see. And from this point of view, of course, you immediately see why the these band electrons don't conduct. There's nothing mysterious about a filled band doesn't conduct or anything. It's just very simple. It's this. If you look at these states, this contact wants to keep it filled. Why? Because, you know, the chemical potentials up here, these states are all down here, they just keep it filled. That contact also wants to keep it filled, you know, because its electrochemical potential is here. Well, fine, it just stays filled. That's it. So, these are all filled, but no current flows. Everyone's happy, done. So, this is exactly why, if, I mean, these don't conduct, what conducts is up here. And this is a very important point, that when you're trying to understand conduction, you don't really need to know necessarily everything about the density of states at all energies. Because as you know, when you're looking at this density of states, when I draw this picture here, you're really looking at the tip of the iceberg in the sense that there are core electrons down here, that if, it, if it's, there's one S states and two S states, two P states, all kinds of energies way down there. And you're just looking at this tip. 
the valence electrons on top. And the point is as far as current flow is concerned, that's all you need to know. All you need to know is about these states out here. Anything down here is relatively relevant. Unless you put a voltage big enough to start making it flow. Once you put a bigger voltage and this comes down here, yes, this will start conduct. And that's what happens in graphene, for example, where you have states that are, that are close by and with a reasonable voltage, you might actually start conducting through those. Sure. Okay. Now, <clears throat> given this picture then, how do you write down the current? And this is where, let's say, well, we could do it this way. First, let's think of what the current would be if we just had one level here. Let's say we had a device with just one level. Okay. So then though you could say that, well, the current would be like if an electron takes a time t to transfer from one contact to the other. So the way you think about it is you have this entire reservoir full of electrons trying to get, and there's this one little level and it has to squeeze through that. And so every once in a while, there's a time t, typical time t that tells you how long it takes for an electron for to get from here to there. And in that case, you would write your current as q over t. That's the rate at which you should get through. But then you should multiply it by f1 minus f2. Why? Well, F1 sort of tells you, that's this Fermi function, that tells you whether electrons are available with that energy or not. Because if you're talking of things down here, there's lots of electrons available trying to get through. But then if you're talking of something up here, there's no electrons there. So that's this F1. That tells you rate at which things go this way. And F2 tells you you'd have reverse flow, ones that are trying to get back this way. And so it's F1 minus F2. And that has this essential physics that is, why does current flow? Well, because you have got these two contacts with two different Fermi functions, two different agendas. One trying to fill it up, one trying to empty it, etc. All that physics is right here, F1 minus F2. So that's what you'd get if you had one level. Now, what we want to deal with is some general density of states. Okay, so you look in a certain energy range DE. How many states do I have in there? Well, all right, this out a little bit. So that would be the current through that, and I'll explain this in a minute. I'll put a two there. I'll explain that in a minute, and then if you integrate this, it will be the that will be the current. This is it. Now, why did I divide by two? Well, in general and uh, we'll talk more about this as we go on, that when you look at these states, I tend to think of these as, you know, like a highway that's connecting these two ends. And the thing is, on that highway, it's like there's some that are northbound lanes, some that are southbound lanes, and for going from one side to the other, you have only half the lanes available, basically. Because half go from left to right, the other half are kind of going from right to left. So that's how I justify this. Too. So this is it. So the expression, so what I'm, what I tried to get to you, get here is that first expression up there, see, so let me write that, I, so let me just write this up here, Now, <clears throat> from this, you can obtain an expression for the conductance quickly. And the way you do it is that for small voltages, what you can do is write this F1 minus F2 as dF dE times the chemical potential difference, mu1 minus mu2. Now, how did I do this? This is what you could call sort of a Taylor series expansion. The idea being 
that, well, you see, f1 is this Fermi function with some mu1. So f1 looks like 1 divided by e minus mu1 over kt plus 1. And f2 is 1 divided by e to the power e minus mu2 over kt plus 1. So it's the same function, but with a slightly different mu. So if we are talking of a small voltage, so mu1 and mu2 are different, but by a small fraction of kt. If it's a small voltage, then you can write this difference, f1 minus f2, as del f del mu, that is how much does the function f change with mu, and I'm using the equilibrium value, just take that derivative and multiply it with mu1 minus mu2. So this would be like the first term in your Taylor series, if you think of it that way. And then the point is that because of this nature of the fur function, it depends on e minus mu, so the derivative of f with respect to mu is the same as the derivative of f with respect to e, except with a minus sign. That's all. And so you get that. This is it. Now, <coughs> So this mu1 minus mu2, that's what you can write as q times v. That's the applied voltage because mu has the dimensions of energy. It's this electrochemical potential. And when I apply a voltage, the amount by which the energy levels move up and down is q times v. And so if v is 1 volt, the, it changes by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules, except that usually when we talk of energy, energy, we don't use MKS, we just use electron volts. I mean, don't use joules. So if you put one volt, the energies go down by one electron volt, right? That's it. So that's this QV. So if you put that in there, you'll see integral DE minus del F del E, and then Q square D over 2t times b. That's i. And I can take the v out from here, put it here. So that's the conductance. This is it. Okay. Now, this quantity here, it represents kind of an averaging. And so, you know, it, often I find it convenient to basically say, well, conductance is this, and this is something that depends on energy. And what you should do is if you actually want the conductance, you should average it over energy according to that function. Because if you look at del F del E, what does it look like? Say, so, you see, the Fermi function looks like this. If you look at its derivative, See, it's zero way up here. Then right around here, there's a big change. And then again, it's zero. So that function, del F del E, it has a peak right around here. And that's what I tried to plot up there. So what's on the right-hand side, that's the Fermi function. What's on the left-hand side, that's like the derivative of that. You just plot that out, you'll see this function. And <clears throat> the important thing to note is that this function firstly has a peak right here and has a width, and the width is of the order of kT. I mean, around 4 kT or so, the width, because the energy range over which things change, that's a few kT. And the peak value is actually about 1 over 4 kT. And the point is that the area under this curve is actually 1. So if this were really sharp, you could think of it as a delta function, you know, with area 1. But basic point is that over a range of kT, when you do something like this, what you're doing is taking this function and averaging it over a range of the order of kT. That's about it. So you don't have to keep carrying this around, you know. This makes it look more complicated than physically it is. Physically, it's really just that quantity averaged. That's how you should think about it. Now, how do I show that the area is 1? Well, 
you know, if you write down that function, you'll see, you'll have to take this, take its derivative and all that. But actually the fact that the area is one actually is very easy to show because you see it's integral dA minus del F zero del E. So that's the function we're talking about and I'm integrating it from one end to the other. So that's equal to of course F zero one end to the other. And of course one end it is one, the other end it's zero. So that's basically one. I think there's a minus sign there. Yeah, that's it. So the area is one that's very easy to see. That's in a minute. Right? That's it. Okay. So the important concepts I wanted to make sure everyone's comfortable with. First is this density of states. What are the how many channels, how many lanes do I have available for conduction? That's of course central. And in order to conduct, what you really need is channels right around your chemical potential. Why? Because conduction is determined by the difference between the two Fermi functions. For low voltages, that basically amounts to looking at this narrow range of energies right around KT. Because this tells you, this is the conductance at a given energy, but then actual conductance you get is averaged according to that. That's how I think about it, okay? So that's the way that result is written up there, that we have integral dE, let me put a 1 over Q here, so you make this Q square. So then this quantity is what I call the conductance as a function of energy, G of E. So this is the quantity that I wrote as G of E. And then the idea is that anytime you want the actual conductance, you should average over df dE. In average according to this. And so, and what is the expression for this conductance? That's what we just obtained, which is that it's equal to Q square D over 2T. We won't write this anymore. Or I'll write it here. So that's where we have come so far. So what I'll do then in the next few minutes is we'll try to obtain another expression, we'll go from here and get a expression that will get us to this idea. That you know, I said that when you get to small devices, instead of the usual Ohm's law, rho L over A, you actually get something like rho L plus lambda over A. Right? And that's the result I want to get. And what I'll do is I'll start from here we'll, and we'll get there. Okay. That's it. Now, when we want to apply this to something relatively big, one of the things you expect is that this density of states would be proportional to the volume of the region you are considering. Why? Because if you think of, you know, if you think of a region with say 10 states in it and another one, another 10, and together this number of states would be like 20. In general, you know, we'll get into this thing about how you calculate the density of states, how you model the density of state. But the one basic point is that when you get down to something small, of course, there is no simple rule, but once you get to big things, usually the density of states is proportional to the volume. So you take something that big and you put two of them, you'll have twice as many states overall. Okay? So D should be proportional to the area times the length. So, so this quantity here should be proportional to the volume of the solid that we are considering. And so, and the question we are asking is, how does the conductance or the resistance, because this is conductance, I could go resistance and write it the other way, 2D over 2 squared D. And the thing is, this is proportional to A times L. Now, this would just tell you that the resistance should go down as AL. But what we need to consider is how the transfer time changes. 
the time it takes for an electron to get from left to right, how does that depend on this area and length? That is, if you are considering a conductor whose length is L and whose cross section is this area A, cross section, or if it's a two dimensional thing, you could just think of the width, or if it's a three dimensional thing, then the cross sectional area A. That's this. So what we need to talk about is what time does it take for an electron to get from left to right? And this is where you'd say, well, you know, if it's a ballistic conduction, if electrons go straight through, then the time is pretty clear. It should be, should just be T equals L over V, right? Whatever velocity it is, it has. And it's kind of true. If you want to be little more accurate, I'd say it is the velocity in the z direction. Z meaning, I'll call this direction the z direction. That's the direction of current flow. And in general, you have electrons going at various angles. And of course, what helps it get through is just the z component. So you might say this, and this since it's different for different electrons, you could say I'll just use the average. Great. Okay. Now, in this limit then, you can see that T would be proportional to L, and then your resistance would go as 1 over area, because the length would cancel out. And that's exactly what you see for ballistic conductors. You see, in ballistic conductors, you know, people have now made measurements on carbon nanotubes, for example, which are on, which even for a fraction of a micron is ballistic. And then you make it twice as long, the resistance doesn't change really, once you're in that limit. So it's independent of length. Unlike Ohm's law, which tells you, you know, you make something twice, resistance should be twice. But actually, <clears throat> in this ballistic regime, it is independent of length. But then you make the area bigger, the resistance just does go down. So it is inversely proportional to the area, but independent of length. And that comes out very nicely here. Now, what happens in diffusive conductors is that as you know, this diffusive motion means that electrons don't go straight through, but instead they kind of have this random walk. Right? What you say is sort of like a drunken person trying to get through. And you know, he takes a few steps in one direction, then another, and so on. And it, of course, takes him a whole lot longer now to get through. It's not just L over V. Okay. And this is this random walk problem that has been analyzed many different ways. For the moment, I'll just state the answer. And if this you'd like to discuss this further, we can talk in the discussion sessions about it. But the basic result is that instead of being L over V, it is more like L squared divided by two times something that people call the diffusion coefficient. So it is Vz squared tau where tau is this mean free time. That is the length of time that an electron, that a length of time that an electron travels before it gets scattered, before it turns around. That's the mean free time. And this is the quantity that you call the diffusion coefficient. Okay? And the time it takes then is L squared divided by twice the diffusion coefficient. This, if you have not seen it before, we can discuss further, but then let's go with this. Now the point is that once you accept this one, then you can kind of see where Ohm's law comes from. Because you see the density of states proportional to area times length, this one's proportional to L square, and then you can see you'll get L over A, just like Ohm's law. You see? And in general then, we could say that the time it takes to cross a region has two parts to it. For one that is proportional to length, one that's proportional to L square. Again, you can think of that as a Taylor series expansion also, if you like, that, you know, the, uh, this time is proportional to, I mean, it depends on length. The first term is proportional to L, then there's L square. And when you go to big lengths, of course, this one will take over. When you go to small lengths, this one will. That would be one way to interpolate. So if you write that, then you see from here, you can get 2 over Q squared D and then times the time, and that's this. C 
So, for the time I put in these two things, okay. that is it. Yes, please. Is there any weight attached to the two different terms in time? Because it's like those two terms are by two different mechanisms, right? So are there any weights attached to that? Okay. So now the way I was viewing it is right. I guess the yeah, thanks. Yeah, the question was that these are sound like two different mechanisms. So very good question that. Is there a way to, should there be a kind of weighting to this one and to that one? <clears throat> I'd say the best way I justify this is by saying that, okay, let's say we write T as these two different lengths and then we get this from the long length limit and you get this one from the short length limit. And then I say that this is the only combination that will work at both limits and hence I'm using it. Okay, because anything else you put here or here would mean that it won't work in the, either the long limit or the short limit. That would be my justification. Okay. Now one could ask whether, you know, shouldn't there, could there be an L cube term or so on. And this is why I'd say this random walk problem has been analyzed very carefully in a, over in many places, many different ways. And I think what they find is basically this, okay, this length. So, based on this then, you'd write the resistance like this and now I think I can get this form that I had mentioned earlier. That is, let me just write the resistance as and what I'll do is I think all I did was kind of took this out and put it here, okay. So I had an L over something plus L square over something. I took L over this, put it outside and then inside you get something like this. And this is the quantity then you could, we'll say, we'll call the mean free path. Now. Roughly speaking, you can see what it is, Vz square tau divided by Vz. So that's like Vz times tau, roughly speaking. And that's basically what you think should be the mean free path. The tau is the mean free time. How far does it get in that time? Well, it's velocity times that time. So you can roughly see that. Now the part that is needs more discussion and we can go into in the discussion section is what these averages give you. Because when you take those averages, you get certain numerical factors that go with it. So for example, one of the things that's useful to know is that the average of Vz square is actually equal to the magnitude of V square. So we are assuming that let's say you have electrons with a certain velocity, ma magnitude, but any angle. So this is the magnitude, which is a fixed number. And when you average over the angle, you'll get this divided by the number of dimensions. So in one dimension, it's just v square. In two dimensions, it will be half. In three dimensions, it will be one third. Now the average of vz, that one takes a little more discussion. This one, the way you can see why it is number of dimensions is something very simple. Let's say we have two dimensions. Then of course, just you'd expect since everything is isotropic, that vy squared is equal to vz squared. And so if you look at v square, that should be equal to like the sum of the two, which should be equal to 2 times Vz square. Hence, Vz square is half of V square. So in two dimensions, this would be it. In three dimensions, you add the x to that story. So you can actually see very quickly why the average of Vz square is like half or one third or one of the V square. 
let's say. Whereas the average of VZ, it's a little takes a little more work. But we can get into that if you like in the discussion session. Okay. Okay, so this would then be the expression we have. This is L plus lambda, that's this mean free path. And what's in front then is what we could call the resistivity. This is then what you could call the resistivity rho, which is And so the conductivity, oh, actually, um, I guess this I should call rho over A. So if I want resistivity, I should really put an area there. And this then makes sense, density of states per unit volume. That's a number that's independent of, we said the density of states should be proportional to the volume. So when you divide it, this would be density of states per unit volume. So it's conductivity would be Q square times density of states per unit volume times Vz squared tau. This is it, yeah. Please. Uh, in this simple model, no. Oh, the question was whether the tau depends on length, usually. And the picture we have here is that an electron goes from for a length of time tau and then scatters and then scatters again. And that should not, that particular time should not depend on how long it has to go ordinarily, right? That's how you picture. Now, if it's a very short device, that's when, of course, it doesn't even have time to scatter. But all that, I think, we have included by writing the total transfer time as L over Vz plus L square over. So the fact that when you get to really short lengths, it is, yeah, doesn't depend on tau at all, that physics is already included here. Okay? And the ta time tau really comes in when you have long things, and in long things, you know, how long it goes before it scatters, that should not depend on how long it is. That is, that would be my argument. Okay. okay. So this expression we have here then for the conductivity, that's actually a standard expression, you see. This is conductivity. It's just that it's not very familiar. Not many people, not many people are familiar with this. Q squared times the density of states per unit volume times the diffusion coefficient. And the reason is uh, that usually it's not derived quite this simply. You see, the, you, the reason we could do it so simply is because we are talking about this very small resistor where we assume that electrons just go through this without changing energy. What I assumed is electrons can scatter inside, but it doesn't change energies and goes right through. And that is sort of what allowed me you know, to say that, well, they have these two Fermi functions at the two ends, and we'll calculate the resistance, and allowed me to do this relatively simply. Whereas, usually these are derived in much more, with much more advanced approaches. You know, either going to the Boltzmann formalism or using Kubo formalism, but the final result is this. That's the conductivity. And, you now you take a standard textbook like, uh, say, solid state physics like Ashcroft and Merman, that formula is there, it's just that it's in chapter 13. So that you often don't get that far and you don't often carry this in your head, that's all. Like when you're thinking of things, that's not how you're normally thinking. You have some other, you know, like root formula, other things that I'll relate to that you carry in your head usually. So the result itself though is very, yeah. And the important thing is that when you think about it, it's like this is something that depends on energy and if you actually want the conductivity, you should average it using that Fermi function, uh, that DFD, what I call the thermal broadening function, the derivative. That's the important thing. So you'll have different things at this energy, this energy, etc., and it's this average that matters. So you're done. Okay. 
Okay. Now, <clears throat> one of the important results though, that is not as widely appreciated, which came out of this, is that the resistance is not rho L over A, but rho L plus lambda over A. That we got by including this term. Because usually when you are analyzing these things, you assume it's all in the diffusive limit. But by putting that in, you get this extra L plus lambda. And, and that also gets you this. And in terms of conductivity, what it means is that actual conductance is like sigma A over L plus lambda. And resistance is rho L plus lambda over A. That's, that's the new part of it, right? Okay. Now, what it tells you, if you think about it, is almost like what you're saying is, well, if you made this shorter and shorter, as it tends to zero, it kind of behaves as if there is a length, it has a length lambda. That's this mean free path. And as after that, when you get it really short, it still looks like a conductor whose length is about a mean free path. Now that statement kind of bothers you a little bit because you see, if you think about it, you've got this something very short where there is no scattering. So why should its mean free path be so important? You know, physically, what does it mean to talk about the mean free path in a device that's really short? And the point I want to make next is that you see, that quantity uh, if you look at the ballistic limit so if you take this r let's say we write it this way rho lambda over a times 1 plus l over lambda see it's exactly what the, what i had here but i pulled the lambda out so this then is the resistance of something that is ballistic, right? If your L goes to zero, that's this quantity. And you might say, well, you know, in a ballistic conductor, what does it mean to talk about a mean free path anyway? Why should that matter? And the answer is it really doesn't matter at all, actually. That rho and the lambda is because of the way we did this. This has no particular meaning in a ballistic conductor. Neither does that. But the product actually has a meaning because, you see, if you look at our expressions, that's rho and that's lambda. And if you multiply those two things, you'll notice that tau just cancels out. So mean free time is nowhere in the picture. Really, It's just because of the way we got there, it looks like there's a rho and there's a lambda, but none of them individually have any meaning at all. Really. So if you look at rho lambda, what is it? If you're just multiplying those two things. Right? So let's write that here. So let's try to write rho times lambda. And so lambda is whatever's up there. So that's rho lambda. And then if I divide by A, I can put that here. So you'll notice what you get. That's it. No tau's anywhere. The mean free time's out, as you might expect. So this quantity then, as I said, it's, it's the ballistic resistance of, of a conductor. And it's got nothing to know, has no mean free times or anything in it. And of course, one of the important things that came out of the experiments in the late 80s and early 90s is that when they looked at small conductor, they found that this conductance actually comes in integer multiples of this Q squared over H. So actually I'm writing resistance here, so it'll be like H over Q squared M. And this, this as you notice is a fundamental constant. It's this Planck's constant, this is the charge on an electron squared. And if you put in those numbers, that comes to about 25 kilo ohms. If you put in the Planck's constant, put in the charge on an electron, this would be about 25 kilo ohms. 25.9 or so. And in all the theory of small conductors, of course, usually this has, plays a very important role. Because what was discovered is that in these ballistic conductors, the conductance that you, the resistance that you get is like 25 kilo ohms or 25 kilo ohms divided by 2, 25 kilo ohms divided by 4, etc. Right? 
comes in into. And the way you now think about it is that if you had just one channel, then it would have been 25 kilo ohms. So in a way, this M is a measure of the number of channels in your conductor. So any conductor, you can think of as lots of channels, and this sort of tells you the number of channels. And in big conductors, what happens is that's what becomes proportional to the area. When you get down to small conductors, of course, it's not necessarily proportional. You can say, well, there's two of them or 10 of them, 12 of them, 50, 16 of them, etc. But when you go to big conductors, it gets proportional. So, <clears throat> so what is the resistivity of, say, copper? From this point of view, the way I would do it is, you see, so if you wanted the resistivity <coughs> of copper, I'd say, well, it's like H over Q squared M, and then times, I guess, this is, what was that? I guess we had rho lambda over A, that's equal to H over Q squared M. So if you want rho, you should do H over Q squared M area, and then uh, 1 over lambda, I suppose. So from this point of view, okay, what is h over q square? Well, that's this 25 kilo ohms. Okay. How many channels do we have per unit area? Well, in metals, it's approximately equal to the number of atoms. It's almost as if every atom in your cross section gives you a channel. In semiconductors, it's a whole lot less. You get like one channel for every like 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer or 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer. But in a metal, it's like every Atom is giving you a channel, actually. And so, <clears throat> for copper, you could say, well, if I had, say, one channel for every one nanometer by one nanometer, then the number of modes per unit area would be like 10 to the 18th per square meter, for example. So you would have put like 10 to the power minus 18 meters square. And then the mean free path in copper is about 50 nanometers or so. I mean, just so it cancels out, maybe I'll put 25 nanometers. And you can see what you get. You'll get, you know, you'll get about the right order of magnitude ohm meters for the resistivity. The point I'm trying to make is that this is a whole different way of viewing it. That what is it, what determines the resistivity of copper? Well, it's 25 kilo ohm per mode. Then you ask the question, how many channels do I have? How many highways? How many lanes on my highway? And there you say, well, I got about one for every, say, a third of a nanometer to a third of a nanometer, because that's the size of an atom, you know, three angstrom by three angstrom, let's say. So you got one for every third of a nanometer or so, and you get some number. So maybe 10 to the power minus 19th would be a better number here, because three times three is about 10 for this discussion. And then that tells you how many channels, and then there's the mean free path, the lambda that you put in. So that's then with the resistivity you'd get. Okay. Okay, so this is the viewpoint that I wanted to get across. Now, what I want to do in the next few minutes then is connect a little bit to the standard expression for resistivity that you might be familiar with. And that is where, you see, if I if you look at the results up there. For conductivity, I think we talked about there's the first expression, that's this density of states times diffusion coefficient for conductivity. That I think you are, we just discussed. Yeah, this one, uh, this one we have seen. This is something we have discussed and now I just want to tell you a little bit about this, this expression where it comes from. That's it. So I have this expression. Ways. 
So this is what I was writing as Vz square tau and now I am writing it as V square tau divided by the number of dimensions. As I mentioned, the average of Vz square is like V square divided by the number of dimensions. Right. Now, what I want to get at is this next expression. So, and this is kind of familiar in the sense that the expression that you may have seen because most discussions of transport usually start with this root formula and you calculate the conductivity and usually what you see is Q square N tau over M. This is an expression that this is the one that everyone carries in their head. So what's the conductivity is Q square N tau over M. See and the <clears throat> problem with this one as I've said, I mean the reason I want to stress this more than that is that this one's very general. This is about the density of states and it also stresses this point that what really matters is the density of states right around the Fermi energy. Whereas this one kind of gives you an impression that conductivity depends on how many electrons you have and that's really not true because as I said you take the best insulator and the best conductor they have about the same total number of electrons. So when you say that it depends on the electron density, what you mean is let us look at only the electron density in this band, not anything down there. So you, of course, if you include all that, they will be wrong. And so then they say, well, you know, the field bands don't conduct, so you have to take only this one, etc. But the basic point, of course, is that conduction only depends on the density of states at this energy. But what I want to show next is that the density of states here can be related to the total number of electrons here as long as it is just that much, as long as you just include that, if you adopt a certain model for the density of states. You see, so far I've ad avoided adopting any models. I said only well, you know, density of states wherever it comes from. So it means you can apply it to molecules, you could apply it to amorphous conductors, you could anything. As long as you have the density of states, you can go on from there. But now I'm going to adopt a specific model which involves an EK relation of some sort, right? And so it would be of limited validity, but the reason I'm kind of doing it is I want to connect here and the other important thing I'm de de describing it, leaving more general is that I'm writing it as velocity divided by momentum whereas the usual expression has a mass there and of course mom momentum is like mass times velocity. It is just that that's only true in parabolic bands. In a non-parabolic band what I feel is that instead of this you should use really this and then what you get that effective the mass which is P over V might well be energy dependent and that is something one should take into account when trying to interpret things like mobility and what you're talking about. Right? So in graphene is a very good example again where P over V is actually energy dependent. It's not just a number. Okay. 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 So how do you get from here to here? That's the point I want to make. Okay. <coughs> Now the way it works is that what we say is that one of the important insights in solid state physics back from the 40s and 50s was that inside a solid an electron behaves almost as if it has a free electron, almost as if it's going through the vacuum. So all these density of states, you know, how do you calculate them? You solve Schrodinger equation, you have to include all the nuclear potentials. If you look inside a solid, it's a very complicated ob object. There's all these atomic potentials that the electron is going through. But the great insight was that as long as you're talking about electrons within this conduction band, it behaves almost as if it's going through vacuum, almost as if we're talking of free electrons in vacuum, but with a different mass, right? We have a certain EK relation. So this EK, let me, I'll write it as EP relation. So usually often you write it as P squared over 2M. So P is momentum and usually people re uh, relate the P to K through this H bar K. And this is the most common form of the EP EK relation or I guess there's often a constant added to this. But graphene for example doesn't have a parabolic relation. It doesn't depend on P square. It depends actually linearly on P. So that's one of the materials there's a lot of interest in. 
So there it will be more like E p is equal to some constant times magnitude of p. So when you plot this, it may look something like this. Whereas when you plot that one, it will look something like that. So these are various key relations that you are used. And then the way you calculate the density of states based on this is by saying that, well, given any box like this, the only those momenta are allowed. I mean, the way this is, it's like you can choose any momentum and there's a corresponding energy level. But then when you say that, well, if I have a box, then only those momenta are allowed which give you a integral number of wavelengths. And how do you get the wavelength? That's this de Broglie relation. That you say that lambda is equal to h over p. So the length of the box must be some integer times h over p. And so accordingly, the p, I guess you the p will be spaced by units of h over l. So you could write it as p is equal to dj. And this is the simple picture that people use for counting the number of states, for coming up with a model for this density of states. Because so far I've said, you know, density of states, we don't know where it comes from. But given that, let's calculate conductance, current, everything. So now you're saying, well, we are going to adopt this model for it. And based on this model, the way you'd count states then, you can define something, which is what I'll call this n of p. So let us define this n of p as the total number of states which have a total number of states who, which have p less than some maximum value. So total number of states that are contained in here. So this is the momentum. This is Px, Py. So how many do I have in here? And in one dimension, it would be something like, okay, how many do I have all the way from minus P to plus P, for example? And the point is that the allowed values would be spaced by H over L. So you'd say, well, the total number must be equal to 2p divided by h over l. So in one dimension. So this model then gives you a total number of states available that is proportional to the length of the solid. You make it twice, you get twice as many total number of states up to a certain energy, up to a certain momentum p. Now if you had to do this in two dimensions, it would be sort of like p square, p over, you know, h over l, and then another h over w. And ordinarily you might have thought 4, but then 4 would be if you were kind of finding how many states are within this square. But actually, you want the number of states within this circle, so it's more like, actually, if you do it, you know, the pi there. And when you do it in three dimensions, it is something like 4 pi over 3 p cubed divided by h over l, and then you know h squared over area. So this is how you norm count the total number of states up to a certain point. So if all the states were filled up to a certain maximum momentum, how many electrons would you have? That would be the number. Now you want density of states. How do you get density of states out of that? You look at the derivative of that with respect to energy. This gives you a total number of states. Well, if I increase it a little bit, how many extra states do I pick up? So that's how you usually do it. So <clears throat> the bottom line is that when you calculate density of states, Should be something like D D E because what I just wrote is N of P, but then E and P are related. I'm assuming it's all isotropic, so the energy can be related to the magnitude of the momentum 
That's this EP relation I have. So given this, I can always turn it into N of E. E and P are related things. So here, for example, I could easily have, so it is density of states is the derivative of this N with respect to E. But once I have this, I could turn it into, so you could have done it, for example, like dn dp and then dp dE. for example. You could have done it that way. So that's how you could calculate this density of state. Now the important result that is useful here, and that's what I'll be showing in a minute, is the following. And that is regardless of the EK relation, no matter what it is, what I can show is that As long as you're counting states in this way, what I can show is the following. The density of states times velocity times momentum is equal to N of E times the dimensions. This is a general result that I can show and I'll do that in a minute. That's basically the last thing I'll do in this lecture. So, but if you accept this, then you can kind of see how that relation becomes this. Why? Because density of states divided by the number of dimensions is like n divided by v times p and then. So from here to here, basically all I am using is this particular relation. That's it. And the importance of this relation is, you can see, you see, density of states, that's a property at a given energy. n that's like the total number of electrons up to that energy. And the thing is, it is relating the density of states at energy to the total number of electrons up to that energy. See, if total number of states up to that energy. So conduction depends only on the density of states right here. But that relation will now relate it, density of states, to the total number of states in here. Everything in there. That's, that's the importance of this. Not parabolic, any EP relation. So, uh, so the power of this is that it works for any EP relation, whatever it is, any EP relation. So it could be graphene, it could be anything else. It would, this would still be true. Now, And then you can see that the conductivity depends on this electron density. You could say, well, it depends on the electron density, tau, and then V over P. And V over P is then what you could call mass, and then this would be like the Drude formula. Okay. Okay. So let me just take a couple of minutes to get this result. Then I think I'll take it stop. Okay. So the basic idea is what we saw was that N of P that is the total number of states up to a certain momentum p is proportional to p to the power the number of dimensions. And there's some constant up front, but we don't need to worry about that one, whatever it is. Because if it's one dimension, it's proportional to p. Two dimensions, p squared. Three dimensions, p cubed. Okay? So whatever it is, it will depend on that. And so when you take dn dp, you will get k times d times p to the power d minus 1. And you do d and d. That's it. Okay. Now, what we want is this density of states, say, d of e. equal to
Now, by definition, velocity is actually dE dP. And whenever you have any EP relation, the way you define velocity, this is group velocity. It's actually derivative. So this quantity is actually 1 over V. Therefore, so I take the V over to this side, you get K D e to the power d minus 1. Okay. Now I multiply by p on both sides. So I multiply by another p, so this becomes p to the power d. And k times p to the power d, that of course was n in the first place. So that's basically the relation I was using. This is what I said that density of states times V times P is equal to the total number of electrons times the number of dimensions. And that is what I used in order to get from here to here. And the reason I am going through all this is, as I said, that this, both these expressions for conductivity are in the literature. This is the one you carry in your head, sort of n q square tau over m, except that instead of m, the point I am making is you should really take the ratio of velocity to momentum, which may not be a number, which may be actually energy dependent under certain conditions. But otherwise, this is the one you carry in your head. This one is also a standard literature, except that it is not something you usually remember. And the reason, as I said, you look at Ashcroft and Merman, this is in chapter 1, that is in chapter 13. I mean, that is why you usually go, and that is, but the way we did it, this one came more natural. And so, what I wanted to do is connect this to this. And philosophically, there is an enormous difference because this one tells you conductivity depends on density of states at one energy. This one tells you conductivity depends on all the electrons up to that energy. These are philosophical kind of two different things, you see. And this is the relation which, of course, is based on this particular model for density of states. I mean, the only assumption I made was this. As long as you accept this, this follows. Based on, but this particular assumption, of course, may not hold in an amorphous conductor, would not hold in a molecule, for example, etc. There are all kinds of places where you may not want to use this. What that means is, I would still be able to use this, but may not be this. That's all. Okay. So let me stop here now, and the next lecture will be by Professor Lundstrom on transistors. And this afternoon, I will continue. Thank you. Yes. We are still using the distribution. Yes. Very good question. I guess the question was that this is transport, which is a non-equilibrium process. So, why are we using an equilibrium Fermi function? Okay. Now. The point I want to make is that it's a non-equilibrium process, but the non-equilibrium is because you have got these two different Fermi functions. That is, the idea is at the ends of these two contacts, which are big contacts, so that they are essentially in local equilibrium. That's the picture. So this is an equilibrium. That's an equilibrium by itself. What is in between, of course, is can be badly out of equilibrium in general. And so whatever f's appear in our equations, like if you look at that top equation with the f1 minus f2, those are f's in the contacts. So this afternoon I'll try to talk a little bit more about f inside the channel. What does it look like? And that one need not in general look like a Fermi function, although often people kind of make that approximation to simplify calculations, but there's a lot of discussion with it what that should, but I'll talk a little more about it this afternoon, okay? Yes, please. So here we always talk about the density of state in the equations. So what if there's no density of state at all? Like there's no emission through the vacuum again. So that would be like tunneling through something, for example. So we cannot describe the density of state. No, there is still a density of, local density of states. It is, so for example, if this is a, as you said, so the question was, what if this is a vacuum, for example, where there is no density of states? So 
So, if this was like two things separated by vacuum and then I would say the current really flows only when they are really close together and when they are close together it means that if you carefully calculated the density of states you would find something here. So, usually in a vacuum let us say that all the density of states is way up there but when you get it close enough these states from the two contacts penetrate in so there is still something in there anyway. So, there is effectively some density of states, but the whether it would in that case whether it is useful to think of it this way I am not completely sure. What we will talk about I guess tomorrow morning is when, when you talk about quantum transport is that from the quantum formalism you get a different expression for that conductance function up there. So, here I said conductance is q square d over t. So, from the quantum formulas you will get a different expression for the conductance. The ex overall though once you have that it is still the same expression for current. It is just that instead of q square d over 2 t we have a something more quantum mechanically defined function.